Are those skis? What the hell are those things? It's just wood. It's a two by four. Chris, we're at an hour and 55, 58 <laughs> minutes now. We got to wrap it up. Enough All right, about see my, you later. my background. See what I got to deal with here. This guy doesn't even want to talk on a talking podcast. He just wants to wrap it up and go on with life. I mean, <laughs> geez, I don't know. I wanted to wax poetically about his, his unbelievable set there. His wood decorated with lights around it. Uh, phenomenal. This is Chris Sims on Button. Ahmed Farid is here. Yeah. We are together. This is not a Zoom session. Correct. We have our girl Morgan here today. Yes. She's got a ring on it. Let's like, clap it up. Congratulations, Booyah. Morgan. Morgan. I mean, we wouldn't be relevant on social media if it wasn't for our girl Morgan. And now she made her soon to be future husband relevant in the world. He's got something <laughs> good yeah. and positive to talk about. So yeah, we clapped it up for yeah. Morgan for sure. What a great holiday Congrats. for Morgan, right? Yeah, we, seriously. We walked in and, and we have all these bright lights on. And I was like, oh man, the lights are already like shining in my eyes. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't the lights. We hadn't yeah. turned them on yet. It, it was, was that the bling ring. bling. It was the ring. Uh, that thing is popping over there. It is popping. It is. <laughs> Woo Can't hide money. Right there. <laughs> Big money. Congrats. So it's been a good it's been a good holiday so far. We talked about a, a little bit of it. You uh participated in helping out your wife. I did. Look at that. On Christmas Eve. A little good little elf I am. Uh, and uh you gave everyone the day off except for Pete and me. Right. And some editors on Monday. So yeah. we did the pod from home. Yep. And you saw my skis in the background. You there. act like I had the call there. Like like I made the call. <laughs> like if it was up to me, I would have no credit for it. I'd have got no pod too. I'd have been let's take the day uh, off. All I could have used it. Yeah. I could have I don't know what it is. I am having more trouble this week. I'm as, I'm so fing tired. Yeah. I don't I, I guess it's just everything's caught up. I don't know. And the weekend of festivities and family and drinking and Everything else, and yeah, the fact that it was not a Christmas break and it went right on our weekend. Just, uh, I, I've this is the hardest week I've had of waking up. Like, slept through my snooze. Oof. You know, slept to the end of the snooze. I'm a guy that hits the snooze at 5:30. Yeah. It sno- It goes off again at 5:39. I usually at 5:32 or 5:33, right? Turn it off and get out of bed. And okay. I'm like, okay, it's time to get up. Like the last two days. I've literally been like, oh, shit, there, and the snooze alarm has gone off, like totally slept through. That's when I know I'm tired. And now knowing you, you don't leave a whole lot of wiggle room. I, you, know, you know I don't. <laughs> I, I have it detailed down to the minutes and seconds. So, so then, when, when were you running into this building and sitting down in your I, chair? I did okay today. Oh, I did okay. okay. Right, you right. Know, they, I got the hair, the coffee machine, all went smoothly. So okay. I, can, I can spare a few minutes as long as everything else goes smoothly. I, I didn't have to rush One it in. One thing goes wrong with a coffee machine, though, and you're oh, going to be it's, late. It's like, that's like, a problem. It's, it's yeah. Yes. Or it's me screaming and yelling <laughs> and totally flustered as I'm yelling, like running out of the house at 6.20 in the morning. Well, let's rally. Let's rally, Because we have, we have three and a half hours of what the F will happen. So a little bit of a different pod yep. this week. We know it's usually what the F happened. You look at tape, which you still did. You yeah. looked at tape from right. this past week. We can weekend. tell you what did, what will, maybe. But we're going to look at, any, at it through the lens of what will happen in these next games coming up. Because we got some real crucial games here. We got Dolphins, Pats. We got Panthers, Bucks. Jets, Seahawks, Vikings, Packers, Steelers, Ravens, and Bills, Bengals. And so you looked at some tape of of these teams that's going to be relevant in how we kind of will predict what's going to happen next week. And these games all have have playoff implications or win the division implications. So we're going to go through these games and what might be relevant in the games that you will be watching this weekend from your couch at home while Chris is in the screening room here at NBC. So let's start with a Week 17 preview, Dolphins and Patriots. Yep. You got the Dolphins sliding right now. Who knows if Tua is going to play? We don't know yet, right? No, well, I, mean, we, I, I, I think it's going to be Teddy Bridgewater. Unlikely to I'm play, hearing. right? Right. Very unlikely to play. I don't know if they've made it official. I think what we are hearing is it's Teddy Bridgewater is going to be. Oh, it's official. It is it official. It is official. It is, yes. Okay, all right. So there we go. Doesn't, doesn't change my thought on the game a whole lot. Again, and that's not disrespect to Tua or anything like that. We know the offense is special. Bridgewater's played before. You know, he can make all the throws. You know, the big thing is he's rusty and hasn't played a lot, but I don't look at it as like, oh, wow, right? This is not one of those backup situations where you go, oh, you know, th- this is Cooper Rush and the Cowboys. They got to change the way they play. They can't just throw the ball over the field, right? So yes. uh, at least they'll be able to still run their offense, and that's why they invested in Teddy Bridgewater in the, in the offseason. All right, so this will change the offense for the Dolphins a little bit. We'll get into that yeah. in a second, kind of what changes with, with Teddy Bridgewater and what you saw this past week. Uh, obviously, two of those three interceptions late in the game were right. bad, but what, right. else, what else did you see? Uh, let's start with the Patriots. Okay. 
Because I feel like this is an interesting story in the league because it, it seems like they haven't been able to figure it out, right? Yeah. Defensively, they've been solid. Offensively, they just haven't with Patricia and Belichick and Joe Judge over there. Haven't been able to, to replace Josh McDaniels. And so let's start here with, with kind of how bad the Patriots have been offensively. Yeah. With two stats and a lie. Okay. Two stats and a cool. lie. Patriots offense, before you get into your notes on, on what they did and how they've looked. Um, here are the here's how it works. You got three I'm stats. I'm nervous about this. This is the first one I'm really nervous You've about. You've never actually. missed one. You've I have them all one, correct. Your whole career. It rides on this one. So here, two of these are are true. One is a lie. The Patriots offense has a bottom five percentage in the red zone. So they score touchdowns per red zone appearance in the bottom five in the NFL. They are bottom five in yards per play. And they are bottom five in plays per drive in the NFL. So all bad news, all bad news. One is not, one is a, a lie. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's not all that bad news. Well, but, uh, yeah, I, I have a feeling the one that's not a lie is still the news isn't that great, I'm guessing. <laughs> but yeah. I'm going to say the bottom two, the last two are, are the, the stats, and that the first one is a lie. So you think that they, they are better not, They're better than the, the bottom zone. five in red zone. So actually, ah, it's, it's they're dead last damn. in the red zone. So the, for the first time ever, you are tired. You are, <laughs> we're starting to find out how tired you are. You've never <laughs> missed two stats in a lie before. So they are dead last at scoring once they get into the red zone, scoring touchdowns just at 39%. Damn. And that is actually 5% worse than the Colts. Who I, are just I, I, I wasn't, you know, I was kind of playing the angle that, you know what, they're, I know they haven't scored a lot of points, but I was kind of playing the angle that, like, man, maybe they're not in the red zone some of those times I'm thinking the stall, drive yeah. stalled out to where it didn't count. Right, so that was kind of my logic to get to that, but they're man. actually mid-pack in uh, yards per play. Right, right. fifteenth in the NFL, five and a half yards per play. Yeah, so maybe they do just the stall out um, once they get to the red zone. I, I don't know. Is that would that be the area where they miss Josh McDaniels the most? I, I would, I would say. I mean, they miss him everywhere, but yeah, yeah, yes, I would. I mean, it's caught you off guard here. No, but. it's it's jo- Josh has they miss ev- Josh everywhere. Yes. I mean, it's, it's 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 no one area. It's every play I look at. There's an every drive I go. Oh, how did they do this? They would have never done this with Josh, or there the receivers would never be this close together, or whatever. Um, but yeah, Josh had a a real red zone attack and understood how red zone defenses play. It had to me some plays, and I know still does that. Like people in football have stolen, and then people will still look at it and go, "Wait, how are they doing this? What is he doing here to get this guy open all the time?" So he is special, you know. Now I sit here and go, you know, bottom five in yards per play, you know, that, that's it's. Ah, I, I I should have thought of that a little bit just because you know they they're like three and out, three and out. Then they hit a go route down the sideline for, you know, thirty five, and they rip off a few big plays, and then they go three and out, three and out, and then it's so yeah, it's interesting, but it's hard to get your your head around the attack or lack of attack with New England. It's still very unimpressive and honestly feel like it's actually going in the wrong direction right now as we talk about it. Okay, so what would yeah. you see when they when they took on the Bengals? Because you figure even with Teddy Broad- Bridgewater with the Dolphins, yeah. Mike McDaniel's going to scheme up some things. They're yeah, going to make right. some big plays. Right. They're probably score some points. So you the Patriots so. are going to need to keep up. Yeah. Uh, against the Bengals, you, you, you said at yeah. one point they can't do crap. They, can, they couldn't do anything. I, I mean... It, th- this is this is one of those games that you chalk up to you go I I just don't know how the game was ever twenty two to eighteen right it's it's one of those it's luck and shamrock up the Patriots ass and the Bengals just fucking things up to where you go it shouldn't have been twenty two nothing it probably should have been thirty to nothing before they started that but then you you know you miss a field goal you're inside the three yard line and have to settle for a field goal you. Your receiver stops running on a slant route inside the red zone where you go, well, at the very least, this should just be an incompletion. Instead, of Boyd stops, lets McCourty intercept the ball. Golden rule, no, no, to do on that route. You know, a Hail Mary on a third and long, just throw it up. Literally, Hail Mary falls into your guy's arm for a touchdown. I, so there's there's not a lot of bright spots me, for me to sit here and look at, Ahmed, to go, well, I see light at the end of the tunnel. I, I almost feel like it's really going to go in the other way because huh. I feel like we're getting the point of the year where, yeah, teams are better, right? There's more accumulation of what they do, tendencies and all that. So people are all more, more over, all over their stuff than they were six and eight weeks ago, right? Cincinnati had no fear 
of their de- of their team. The one thing I think Cincinnati was just like, okay, maybe their run game could be a little scary, but they dominated in that department. I mean, you can't run – Cincinnati's unbelievable run defense, but they couldn't do anything there. And they got in their face and played man-to-man. And one – I don't even think it's – I think there's probably a little fear of some of the speed. Like, you know, they got Tyquan Thornton who can run and all that. Yeah. But I think it goes into also, like, we kind of know the routes are going to run. So we're not necessarily – like, he's going to run a go. He's going to run a deep cross. He's going to run a slant. Okay, so we can play man-to-man that. We know kind of their route tree, if that makes any sense, too. Um, so, yes, it's very underwhelming. It, it, it really is, and it was, like I said, it was clearly who the better team was on the football field in that football game, uh, and just one team who kind of fell asleep at the wheel a few times as they controlled the game. Like I could tell early on in your notes of watching the Patriots' offense, it was like from the get-go, from the first drive, it was like the first third down, you're already like – you're, I was already you're, you're like, sick of it. you're over it. Well, I, well, it just you know you <laughs> see like, you you see games sometimes and you go, hey, the score is misleading, or ooh, you know, I know they didn't score any points here early on in these first few drives, but you see some plays and things, you go, ooh, I, th- this things might break open here the next drive, the, maybe the drive after that, right? This was one of those where you were like, I don't see how the f- they're going to do anything, and I mean the first third down, Hunter Henry got hurt because they ran into his own player, like. It's like the bad news bears sometimes. And that goes into, like, we've talked about spacing with the receivers a few times. There's that. I mean, you know, what was the second third down? You know, the, oh, I, I, the second third down, I don't even know who to blame. There were so many people messed up. Mac Jones signals to the receivers they don't get it. Some are blocking. Some are running routes. Some guys are pass protecting. Other guys are, you know, run block. It just was – it's all over the place. And that's where it's, it's not – Real encouraging what you see on that side. You know, Bill, you yeah. were there for a year. Yeah, um, It was unconventional to bring in Patricia and, and Joe Judge. We didn't even know who was going to be calling the plays up yeah. until it, it, basically the season started. Like, if, if they haven't been getting better, if they've actually been getting worse, like, does he have to make a move? Will he make a move? Does he feel compelled to do that? Like, if you were, if you had control over Bill Belichick, or you were Bill, yeah. what do you do? Yeah, I, I mean, not now. Like, Bill's not the one that's going to, like... Yeah, I'm thinking not, more a- after this year. I, from everything I know, I've said this on PFT a little bit, and I, I, I know people in the connected to this situation, and I, I'm not going to say I know it 100%, but I know enough people connected that I think there's a very real possibility that Billy O'Brien is back there as the offensive coordinator when the season's over. Alabama gets done with their bowl game. From the people I know in the world, that's where he's going. I don't know if it's a for-sure thing, but that's what I've been told I've said that on Pro Football Talk last week or maybe even two weeks ago. Uh, so that's what I would expect, yes. You know, just this, this is not sustainable, and it's not sustainable not only for the product on the field, but it's just it's going to add to the, the rumblings off the field about Bill's lost his touch and he's too old and maybe we need to get rid of him. And, you know, that's to me, to me it already had the look of a guy that was kind of setting it up to get his foot out the door and leave. That, that was one of the things I questioned was like, was he doing this? Cause he doesn't want to break in a new offensive coordinator and do all that. Cause he knows he's going to be leaving in two years, you know, which I still think is a real possibility, but this didn't even pass enough of the test to be able to justify bringing it back. Interesting to see how the off season develops on the offensive side of the yeah. ball, because on the defensive side of the ball, if they're going to win this game against the dolphins, they still have a chance at the postseason. Right. Uh, it's going to be their defense, which looked good in one half yeah. versus the Cincinnati Bengals. First right. half, they gave up 22 points. None in the second half. Gave up like half the yards in the second half. In the first half, they gave up 303 yards. That's crazy. And yes. then 139 uh, in the second half. So, I mean, I guess it's uh, w- which one was more real? Was them getting torched in the first half more real or them uh, shutting the door in the second well, half? Well, I, yeah. I, You've I already think said the Bengals messed some things up. Yeah, they definitely did. I, I think, you know, I, I think, w- one, they, they, they played a team that I think poses some problems with them matchup or they were scared of. And as we've talked about, we, this, they played a quarterback who's – it's next-level stuff. You know, it is. And, and the, the, the maturity that Joe Burrow has in year three – and, you know, I always say that, like, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's easy to be mature when you don't have great physical talent. you got to play the game exactly by the book, right? Mm-hmm. But he's a guy that's got great physical talent. He can make crazy awesome throws and crazy escapes, but he kind of does it by the book a little bit more. 
And as we always talk about, he's just a little more surgical and plays within the pocket and doesn't move out of the pocket until he really has to. Um, so, yeah, I find it more on you – know, the, the Patriots defense is good. Uh, I don't think it's as good as we saw in the second half. I don't think it's as bad as we saw maybe in the first half. But I will say this. Here's my problem with the Patriots, and I know I brought this up a little mm-hmm. bit. And here's – let's just dive into the problem what they had in this Bengals game. Was one – I think there was a real fear of, I don't want to play them man-to-man, right? As much as they have good corners and I think they like them, they don't have that one shutdown guy. And I think they looked at it and went, like, it, it, you really have to have a special duo at corner to think you can match up with T. Higgins and Jamar Chase, right? It, it, it's, it's Chase is like, even when you cover him, he's not covered. And same with T. Higgins, let alone Chase can run by just about anybody. And even in this one, Chase dropped a, a big play down the left sideline. Another moment where you go... Well, they could have been down the field here inside the 10 once again. He dropped a go route, and they had to punt the ball away, right? So that goes into more of the, you know, they messed things up. Right. But the Patriots was very obvious. They wanted nothing to do with them man-to-man. So they played a ton of zones in the first half. And as we talked about, it, it's hard to do that. As basic as Cincinnati is, he's still smart, and it's still – within their basics, good enough to go four and five and six and eight and four and five and just pick you apart that way. So he did that. And then he just waits for his opportunity to kind of strike. He's like a fucking venom snake where he's just like, he sits there with his head in the air and he bobs and weaves and fakes a few bites. But as soon as you put that hand out there long enough, he goes, now it's time. And that's it. He kind of just waits for that. And that's where he's scary good. Um, but, yes, I still felt like in the second half it was more of their mistakes, them being a hair conservative. Mm-hmm. And here's my thing I want to get to with the Patriots. I just wish they were a little more tactically aggressive or forced the issue. And I don't mean like you have to go all out and be aggressive like the Miami Dolphins. But, you know, the good defenses in football at, at some point, you know, they can find ways to let me cause a little chaos, but I can still kind of play a sound defense. Buffalo's the master at it to me, where they can rush five and slant the defensive line but still, you know, be sound in the back end and, and play coverages the right way to where it puts pressure on the defense and there's the skies and I don't know which guy's coming, but it's not so crazy to where you're like, oh, well, if they just pick up this guy, they're going to kill them down the field. To me, there's not enough of that tactical aggressiveness from New England, and I think we've seen that in some of the games where they just are a little too willing to die the slow death for me. And uh, I, I, they're not good enough on offense. They, they yeah. got to force the issue a little every now and then. Do they still have the talent on defense? Like, are, do they have the guys? They, it's not like super good. The secondary is good. I do think the fact that I don't see, I, I think because they don't have that marquee shut down Gilmore, Revis, Akib Talib, I don't see as many of the creative coverages as we've used to see in the past, you know, where we'd see one guy playing man. And then the other six guys in the secondary doing something else on the other side of the field. Or we doubled this guy and this guy's man, and then we're playing zone over here to a bu- it just I see that being a different thing of there. Mm-hmm. So it's not great talent. The only area where I look at them to go they're 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 special is the two pass rushers. That's the only area. Because Uche is like a superstar and Mad Junon we know is really good. But Uche is gonna be like one of the NFL sack leaders as we go on here. I, I do believe that. Uh, yeah, I was, I was trying to get you to Uche, a you Michigan were. guy. Good. A Michigan, yeah, Michigan guy, guy. Who, could, who could be uh, going to the national championship game this year. You'll be rooting on Harbaugh for sure against TCU. I, I love to hear that. Music to my ears uh, <laughs> in the college football semifinals this year. You're back on the Harbaugh bandwagon, right? <laughs> I am. I am. I don't want to see, see anybody in the Big 12 in the championship game. I mean, it just The Big 12 doesn't deserve to be in the Final Four, in my opinion. That's what I want to say. Okay? Uh, so... Uh, yes, for that matter, I'd like to see <laughs> Michigan, Georgia, or Michigan, Ohio State in the national championship game. I wanted to have you kind of gotten into Cincinnati yeah. here a little bit, yeah. and they've got a big one coming up with the Ravens, uh, of course. So I, I kind of want to save that for a second. I want to go back to the Dolphins side yeah, of things okay. here because Let's they got the Patriots. They're going to have to figure out a way right. to beat this um, this Patriots D that might be a little conservative. So you think, like against the Dolphins and what they do, not going to have Tua, going to have Teddy. Do you think the Patriots need to be a little more aggressive? You got to take some tactical aggression. Well, well, let's let's go to their pick six. You know what they did? They finally fucking blitzed and did something. Bur- they had faked the blitz like the whole game and dropped out. 
And I think that's what caught Burrow and company off guard. They were like, oh, well, they'll drop out. They've been dropping out all game. They don't want to be man-to-man with us, right? And Jamar Chase, I think, was supposed to run an out route or a comeback route. And Joe tried to loft it up there and throw it as like, hey, I got to throw it before you're breaking, so I'm going to throw a soft one, right, to where you turn out and boom, it's right there. But Chase, like, kind of went out. The DB had a little outside leverage on him, and I think he thought, wait, he's sitting on me. I'm just going to go. But Joe Burrow had already thrown it. But that's to my point. At least they did something to force the issue and, and cause a, put a little pressure on you that way. Um, yes, I, you can't. Miami is the ultimate team, I say that against. They're the ultimate. Uh, to, to me, that was one of the things at least Green Bay even changed a little in the second half. It's just – a tactical guy blitzing off the edge or we're going to change the front and do, take a little chance on the coverage on this play. And uh, the, the, that, so you have to, because if you just play status quo against them, we saw the best defense in football play status quo against them. And they, if Tua was on that day, they would have thrown for 500 yards against the great, the best defense in football. So that, that's where, yeah, they do too much to think you can just sit back and play vanilla and they'll make the mistake. you got to find some ways to, to throw some curveballs at them. Yeah, Tua definitely did not have a half to remember in the second half of their game against the Green Bay Packers. Delray Beach 2012 says, Hi, Chris, what, what do you up, think Delray? caused Tua's fourth quarter implosion? So the speculation yeah. out there is that he had that first half yeah. uh, concussion, although I don't think they've said that that's when he got the concussion. It's just he's in the concussion protocol uh, right now after showing symptoms, and Clearly was a different half for him. The first half, Tua threw for 229 yards, just 81 in the second half. And the last three possessions in the fourth quarter, they had a chance to come back and win through an interception on each one of those drives. What you see? What you see when you took a closer look at those three picks? Well, like just as much as like we we just talked about, like you know Cincinnati messing the game up, and that shouldn't even have been a game with the Patriots. I think we could probably say the same thing here with Miami. I mean. Miami plays Green Bay, at least in my assessment, that they win nine out of ten times. There was your one time Green Bay could win. That, that was it. it. It's one of those where you watch the game and you're going, there's no way this team is going to win this game, right? Even though I know the outcome, it's like still you're still going, wait, one team can't really run. The other one's opening up holes that are gigantic for Mostert every play. You know, At one point, he's got – seven completions for like 150 yards and the other team is like the only way they scored was on a short field uh, it just it's it's so you know because of a good kick return and they barely got in that time I mean so you're just going well there's no there's just no way eventually this will you know separate itself but you know like we talked about on Monday the Mostert fumble before the half and then the mistakes in the second half and Rodgers making a few plays, but here would be my big thing. Okay, I'm sorry. I just wanted to yep. kind of lay the groundwork there. I, I, I went into this going like, wait, 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 let's see if this concussion really, maybe it did affect him, and that's why he was off in the second half. And I don't doubt that maybe that's why he wasn't off a little bit, but he still has a few plays and throws in the half where you go, well, he's thinking clearly and made a great play here, right, to where it's hard to go, okay, the concussion affect him. I, I, maybe it did to a degree. I don't know what happened to him a little bit here. This is the first, like, what happened moment for me. Like, what are you seeing? What are you looking? Why are you throwing the ball like that? This is the first game we've really said that. I've had other games where I go, I, you know, he left some yards on the field or he should have hit this guy or if he hits him in stride, it should have been a 70-yard touchdown. But these were like, I don't understand what he's thinking and I don't even understand the type of ball he's throwing with these ones. And that's where I guess it was just a little troubling, let alone Green Bay's offensive plays that they made. You know, some of them, I got, you know, that's just unbelievable. I don't know if that's really sustainable to think they're going to be able to do that on a consistent basis. Um, So that was a crazy one. And that's one where out of all the four games Miami has lost, I would think they were the sickest after this one on Monday morning going, how did we lose this one? You know, we outplayed them, we outhit them, we outschemed them, and we lost the football game. So maybe they'll be able to score. Teddy Bridgewater won't leave some of those plays out there on the field. But you did note on the other side of the ball for the Dolphins' defense, there is something that does scare you when they go up against the New England Patriots because they've been blitz happy basically this whole year. Yeah, has been a few games where they haven't blitzed as right. much and had some success, and then a few games where they've blitzed a lot and had a lot of success. Yeah. But for the most part, they seem to rely on, 
on blitzing this season. I think they're fourth in the NFL in blitz rate yep. uh, in their NFL rank. and um, But they're not getting always pressure with the blitz. 19th in the NFL. Everybody's ready for it. pressure with the blitz. That's what I'm saying. Everybody's ready for it with them. So, so you think the Patriots will be ready for it in this 100%. game? A hundred percent. That they f- can come out and line up in some of these blitz alignments. The one thing I can promise you that will be ready to go for New England this week, everything else I can question about their offense, all right? The one thing they'll be ready for is to pick up the blitz. And that's where, one, I think you'd be crazy to do that against a struggling offense like this. And, you know, your, your players are better than them. And your scheme is better, too, as long as you're not overly aggressive and give them too many shots to let me just throw a ball, a, a go route to, to Tyquan Thornton. Or, you know, let me get everybody to the line of scrimmage and they give a reverse to Kendrick Bourne and he runs up the sidelines like last week for a 40-yard gain. That's where they got to be careful here. They're clearly the more talented unit on the team. So, you know, that's – they have good run-stopping defense alignment. The Patriots aren't running the ball that great as of late. That would be – yeah, I would, I would think this is, you know, be careful about the blitz in this game. If you want to play man-to-man, Fine. But don't blitz, you know. Have, play one robber and guys in the middle playing for crossers and doing that. Uh, I think that's the only way they really get burned in this one is if they just do do too much of that. Play solid defense and maybe run the ball. Maybe that's the formula well, for you the Dolphins. Saw that it's, it's, not the too, right? it's not the team we've seen. It's not the team we've seen from the Dolphins. Right. But that's been kind of the chatter. Is that yeah. why, why are they getting away from the run game so quickly? Right. It's a, it's the third week in a row we've broken them down. I think, and we uh, you've probably seen in my notes to just go. Hey, it was a good running day, but I still think they could have ran it more. And, and I think it's it's one thing that, yeah, I just wish there was a little more patience there. And again, I think we've talked about it. They're spoiled by how easy it's been in the passing game and everything there. And then Tua is very good at the RPOs. I don't think Teddy Bridgewater is going to be good, as good in that department. He doesn't have as quick a release. He doesn't have as much experience with it as Tua does. To where maybe that lends itself to wait, we take the RPO option off on some of these and we just hand the ball off no matter what. You know? And to me, if they were just a little more patient and, and stubborn with the run, it's then going to open up the other stuff that we saw so you know easy during the year. And, and right now, yeah, you know, teams are playing for them for the pass. They're, they're, they're more worried about that. They don't totally believe they're going to run. And, yeah, this was another game, I think the third in a row, where I kind of went, eh. They ran it good, but they probably should have ran the ball like eight to ten more times in this one. All right, so I think that's a good uh, encapsulation. We'll talk a little bit more Bengals yeah, later on. Right. Uh, Miami clinches a playoff berth with a win and a Jets loss. Uh, New England is eliminated with a loss, so they cannot They're clinch out, this week. Right. But if they lose this game, they are out and they are done. As far as our next one, Panthers at Buccaneers, two teams on the cusp of the playoffs. You got one team six and nine, and you got the Buccaneers at seven and eight. Uh, the Bucks will clinch the NFC South with a win. Um, and the Panthers still can get in if they win out. Yeah. So they control their own destiny yeah. still. Right. Um, so they uh, did defeat Tampa 21 to three back in week seven. PJ Walker Second start of the season, had 177 yards, a couple of touchdowns. We're like, what is going on? Why, when, when are the Bucks going to kick it in gear? Well, the answer was maybe never. They may, they've won some games, but never really kicked it in gear. So no. we're going to take a closer look at, I mean, they just obliterated, did the Panthers, the Detroit Lions defense, which teams have done, but they did it like no team has ever done before. 520 total yards. It was a franchise record. 320 on the ground, that was a franchise record as well. Had two guys well over 100 yards. So, Carolina Panthers run game. Yeah. And can they control the game against Tom Brady and the Buccaneers coming up this weekend? Um, you took a close look at the the scheme for the Panthers. Maybe the deficiencies of my Detroit Lions as well. But w- but what do you see that you liked from the, the Panthers run game? Well, like we talked about a few weeks ago when they played the Seattle Seahawks, right? And we talked about them on a, on a what, what the F happened Wednesday. Uh, they have... The, they have an offensive line that I think has come together with Icky and Moten at right, you know, right tackle and you know Corbett in the middle. They, they they found their groove and they're very patient with the run game. I think that's the biggest thing. They are totally in do. We're gonna run the ball. We're gonna eat the clock up. You know, if you're gonna be way too aggressive man to man, we'll take a few shots with DJ Moore or somebody down the field, and then we're gonna play through our defense. That's just kind of what they're doing, and. They can move some people in the running game, and they got two running backs who can really hit the hole hard and Foreman and, Chubb and Hubbard. 
there's that. And, you know, the, the funny thing, and I kind of said this to you before the podcast, where when a team has that kind of rushing day, you expect to turn on the film and go, damn, their D-line must have got pushed around, right? And, I mean, I'm talking like the first five, six runs of the game, which was like six rushes, 120 yards or something like that. It, the D tackles had nothing to do with it. They were fine. They, they, they didn't get pushed around. It wasn't one of those where I'm sitting there watching the film going, man, look at that line of scrimmage go backwards every play, like I say some weeks, right? This was more of, I think the first thing is attacking the right parts of how the alignment was a few times and exposing that from the Lions where, you know, they might have done a few things where I just go, I don't know if I would defend it or line up this way. The second thing would be the, the, the linebacker play. The linebacker play was, was pretty below average in this one. It was pretty horrible, actually. You know, whether you want to go with Anzalone or Rodriguez, I, I, it looked like they took Rodriguez out of the game for a period of the time because I think they were messing up run fits. They weren't in the right hole. If they were in the right hole, they were, they were wrong shouldering it, if that makes sense, right? Does that make sense to you, shoulder, right? So let's say my gap is you're the fullback, right? And my gap now is between the fullback and, let's say, the left guard, right? I'm the middle linebacker, so to me it's the right guard, but to you it's the left guard, right? Yep. So, my, so now it's ISO, and you're coming down on me as the fullback, right? Okay, I'm responsible for that gap between the guard and the fullback. And then we have a nose tackle or somebody else that's responsible for the gap between the center and the fullback, right? There's a certain shoulder you're supposed to take it on with, right? So if my gap is between the fullback and the guard, I'll, you're going to come at me. I'm going to leave my. I'm going to hit you with my inside shoulder, my left shoulder, and leave my right shoulder free to make the tackle and clog up the hole. So they messed that up, or they messed up going in the right gap and diagnosing the play the right way. So there was issues like that. Let alone. There was a few times where the defense was designed, hey, we got all the gaps covered up, but we're going to leave this one gap, and it's going to be the corner that's going to have to make the tackle. And corners usually aren't great at tackling, especially when they're real cover guys like a Jeff Akuda, where they got to him a few times in the gap, and they were like, all right, now you got to make the tackle. And he didn't get it done. So, like, you don't take a guy number three to make tackles. Well, you Come don't. On, you don't. Get you don't. Well, there, there's a lot of teams in football that would organize it, and a lot of times they go, I, I'm not going to trust my corner to be in that gap right there because it's not going to end up well if the ball does get in there. Right? So, so that's where planning and alignment and, and how you uh, assess the game does come into handy. So it wasn't as much as a physical whooping as yeah. some of the way things were defended schematically. And then players, especially the second level guys, you know, messing up some run fits in a big but way. But you do think that Sam Darnold adds a nice little element that does help the run game. I, ex he does. W one thing that's always kind of got to overlook that is his movement. And they do have the read option element with Sam Darnold. So his ability to, hey, we've smashed it up the middle, smashed it up the middle, smashed it up the middle, and now that backside DN collapses, he can rip it off, rip off a 15 or 20 yard run. Let alone, he's a very good on the move bootleg thrower, right? My, one of my questions with Sam Darnold his whole career is just throwing in the pocket was the one where I go, I wish he was a little better that way. Mm. When he's moving or scrambling or playing backyard football, it's pretty good. Uh, he's getting better in the pocket department. And they just seem like a team right now that kind of knows who they are. They know how they're playing. And they have a little bit more, it feels like, belief than the Bucks do, if that makes sense. With the Bucks, I just, again, like kind of you said, it just feels like false belief. And I'm not sh sure they really believe that they're any good either. Once they get teams uh, scared of the run, then they hit uh, Terrace Marshall on a one-on-one -on -one or a T.J. Exactly. Moore on a one-on-one -on -one shot. I mean. and right. Sam Darnold has that ability, too. Exactly, yeah. Do they, they have the ability to yeah. run over this Buccaneers run defense, though? Deontay Foreman did it last time, 118 right. yards. Mm -hmm. Last time they played back in Week 7. Uh, Gould99 yeah. says, what is more likely, Panthers rush for over 200 yards or below 50? Ooh. So they go crazy or they get shut down? Uh, it's not going to be below 50. It won't be. I think they've gotten too good at the running game. And, yeah, there's just not enough firepower on the defensive line for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to think me that they're going to shut it down to below 50. So, yeah, I, 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 you know, again, I don't expect 200 yards, but if you're going to give me one of those two options, I'm going to take that over the, the minus 50. Here's what I'm willing to bet yeah. maybe all my money on. 
they will have more rushing yards than the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, you can you can guarantee that in this game. As we switch kind of over to the Panthers defense and what they may do that may make life difficult yeah. for Tom Brady yeah. and the Bucs. Right. You said the Lions' defensive tackles didn't get pushed around. That's been the case most of the year. I think they got some some strong defensive they do. tackles. Yeah. But, right. I mean, I don't know that anyone has the the depth of the Panthers, and you noted that in your notes, too. Yeah. yeah. The DT is up front. They, they got they got a little of everything. I mean, they got size, speed. Uh, they got a lot of interchangeable guys in the front seven, to, uh, you know, some for some versatility. I, I mean, Tampa's not going to run on the Panthers. I know that. And that, that, I mean, that's to me what the, the Steve Wilkes era and him taking over has done. And I think you saw in my notes where uh, this is probably the third time I've kind of broken them down since he's taken over. And it's just, like I said, simplified. And the one thing he's got is like, you're not going to run. And we're going to play a little more single safety defense. And, they're, and then they put pressure on their corners a little bit that way. And that's where I think this could be interesting because they're going to make Brady and them, you know, they're going to get pressure on Brady. They're not going to let them run. And these corners, as you heard me say a few weeks ago, are the real deal. So they're going to make them throw under pressure into tight windows, where I think this is a very, very dicey matchup. You know, And, again, I, I don't know who I'm going to pick in this. i got to think about it a little more, but I'm leaning Panthers. I'm it, not sounds like, it sounds like right. you are. I, I, I definitely am. You know, If the game is played clean and the Panthers don't just shit, their, shit the bed and are overwhelmed by the moment and, oh, my gosh, we're in Tampa and we could beat them and we could actually be in the playoffs – like, if they can just overcome that aspect, that they can definitely stand toe-to-toe and beat the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. There's no doubt. Now, Jared Goff did throw for 355 yards yeah. and three touchdowns. Yeah. Um, a lot of it was in garbage time. Exactly right. Was it all in garbage time? It was, it was you know, big play to start with DJ Chark, yeah. right? You know, he made some big plays. I think it's the, the other plays, the minutia plays that were off. It was the... Like the first down play where you go, well, that, damn, they could have been in second and two, but instead he missed a throw, and now it's still second and ten. Or, damn, it's third and four. If you just put the ball in the money there, that's going to be a first down, but instead they got to punt the ball, right? So it was not a very good game by Jared Goff. It was not. It just – Who'd you pick in that game? Did you pick the Lions or – I did. I picked the Lions. Oh, it was no. a two-and-a-half spread. And then when you saw them come out onto the field and Jared Goff had a glove on, we were like, oh, no. Like, Why did I pick them? Literally was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, not even joking. I know you saw that in my notes <laughs> where I was like, but I'm not even joking. Like, oh, when I was sitting on the couch with my son on Saturday on Christmas Eve, I literally, the first thing I said was, oh, my God, Jared Goff's wearing gloves. Like, what? Like, come on. That, that, that was like, it's 30 degrees. If you could have changed your pick right then, would you have I changed your pick? I would have. I would have. Oh, <laughs> shit. It's over. All right? I mean, oh, over. Right? Why do you hate gloves so much? Uh, it just, to me, like, it, it's... Uh, Again, the the great throwers, the great like his hands were cold. I, I right. Well, it just it, cold shouldn't help, shouldn't affect you. Like listen, zero degrees, five degrees, minus five. I get that. I'm not. I'm all for it then. Thirty degrees. That should not affect your ability to grip the ball and rip it around the or around the field. And uh, it obviously does with him. And to me, it just shows it's in his head a little bit. You know, that that that's that's to me the the biggest thing. But yeah, disappointing for the Lions right there. Panthers, you know, I look at the Panthers and go, yeah, of course they can win this week and beat the Bucks. The other aspect I think of this, right? You want to hear something crazy too? Just again, because you guys, this is the way we're doing the pod. So I was thinking down the road, like they're not a good matchup for the Cowboys. Like that'd be one of the. The teams in the lower half of the league record-wise where I'd go, the Cowboys, that's not a great matchup for them. Big, physical running team, we, we've seen the Cowboys have a problem with that, right? And then some talent in the secondary with a good coach, like I could see that being a little scary for them if they do get in. So this might be one, if you're the, 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 the Cowboys, you're, you're rooting for the Buccaneers huh. to win. If the Bucs are going to win... Uh, it's going to have to be on Tom Brady's right arm. Yeah. Seventh Evan says to you, much was made in the offseason about Bruce Arians taking his red pen to Byron Leftwich and Brady's game plan. Is there a chance we see the red pen in time for the playoffs? At least that's what I hope happens. So, yeah, what what has what has happened with that Bucks offense, you think? And can it change? No, it can't change. Okay. They can't run. The O-line's not the same as we know. It's banged up. I mean, you know, Donovan Smith hurt, wasn't good anyways this year. You know, losing Jensen, you know, losing Kappa in free agency. 
you know, lose your left guard to retire and then lose on, lose the replacement after that. So there's that. There's no Gronk mismatch. There's no jitterbug speed guy, right? That's where Antonio Brown really gave them extra life mm. was, yeah, he could beat you deep, but then he could all do that Julian Edelman stuff over the middle that was scary too. Mike Evans, father time is catching up to him. He's not as explosive. I don't think Chris Godwin's ever really got to totally 100%. So if that, And then you have a quarterback who's 45, and mad respect, but you're that age, and we see that. I see this with number 12 wearing green and yellow. Mm-hmm. They're antsy in the pocket. And when you're all lines like that, it's just he's antsy. It leads to bad decisions because he doesn't want to get hit or rushing the ball like you saw the other night. Some of those plays and throws were – like, you know, it, it's, it's antsy in the pocket. It's jittery. I don't want to wait any longer to see this. I'm just going to get it out of my hand, right? It, it's that, and uh, I think that's the big thing that's changed. Yeah. They have been able to protect him pretty well. They do have some injuries on the offensive line. Ryan Jensen, yeah. though, designated to return from IR today. He gets it out quick, too. That's my other thing is yeah. he's trying to protect the O-line and himself by getting it out quick, but then that's lending it to Ahmed, you know. You know how it is. This is human nature. I got it out quick. I got it out quick. I got it, you know, they're getting after me. And then you kind of get in that mode. And then you come back uh, after one play and go, oh, damn, I had Mike Evans down the middle for 20. Shit. But you've been under pressure and you've been getting out of quick. So you get in that mode and then you start to leave plays and, and opportunities on the field. And I think that's what happens to the Bucks a little bit. You don't know who you're going to pick yet, but I do. You're picking the Panthers. I, it it does game. feel it's like starting that. starting to feel like that. It does feel, feel like, like that. that. I don't know who you're going to pick in this next one. Jets at Seahawks. Two very similar teams, Woo. two seven and eight teams. Yep. That I would think, what, five weeks ago, we're like, I, I would bet that they're going to make the playoffs, mm-hmm. both of them. Mm-hmm. It was like the Seahawks and that offense and the Jets and that defense. You're like, that's good enough. The other side of the ball will, will do just enough to get them into the playoffs. Well, now they play each other. Jets are eliminated with a loss. Seattle is eliminated with a loss and a Washington win or loss and a Green Bay and Lions win. So Seattle, a little bit more of a chance to, to stay alive here, yeah, it looks like. Right. Uh, but they go head-to-head in this one. So real quick, I don't know how much you looked at uh, either I, of these teams. So the Jets on film, I didn't watch it. Because, okay. you know, I just that was the Thursday night standalone game. I got a feel for them. And we watched the Jets a ton. So I did not watch that game on film, just with all transparency. Seattle, Kansas City, yes, both okay. sides. All right, so real quick, just right. the, the Jets, because we have a question on that. Right. Mike White's coming back. Yep. Zach Wilson will never be seen or heard from again in New York. He might never even visit. Like, he might just have such a bad taste in his mouth. Even the great restaurants there, they go, screw him. Yeah. I don't right. want to go back. You're right. You're, I, I, mean, he, I, he, I, I will be shocked if he's back. I don't see it happening. C- C-Pain220 says, does the Jets' O-line do anything at an average level? So maybe it's not just the quarterback. Well, no, no that, that's what's funny. It's like Jets fans admit that, but then when you talk about Zach Wilson, they don't admit it. But, uh, no, it, it's struggling right now. It is. And to me, this is where our guy at, at C. Payne 220 has taken us here. This is definitely one of the keys to the game. Um, how do I want to say this? What, the, yeah, the Jets, it's, the running game has fallen apart. And, and how could it not? I mean, they've had some major injuries on the offensive line. You know, when they were healthy and stuff, that old line was pretty damn good. But they're missing some crucial pieces, right? And I don't think it's an overly creative run game in general. It's kind of basic. They're kind of like one of those just this is what we do and we execute it. Uh, but, but like where I think it's going to be imperative to have some sort of run game this week is just that Seattle is phenomenal in pass defense. They're, they're a pain in the ass. They do, they're very creative in coverages. They're creative in how they can stress the pass protections out. And if you end up in – Second and third and long, you can ask Patrick Mahomes how that's going to work out from last week. It ain't that easy against this group. They got two corners on the outside. They can trust them to play man-to-man when they want. The safeties are pretty good. You know, the linebackers can run and pass coverage. So that's where I go, like, if they think they're going to go up there and that crowd noise and throw it 47 times with Mike White like they did in Minnesota and win the game that way, I'd have a hard time believing that. Not that they have to have a huge game rushing. But they gotta have some success there. They gotta have. They can't be like last week, where they couldn't even get the find the line of scrimmage. If they can just have a running back around sixty or seventy yards rushing, that'll be fine, right? Flirt with a hundred yards as a team rush stat. That'll be good enough 
to say, okay, maybe they can win the game. Huh. But that's a big if. That's a big if because they have not blocked well at all you know, as of late. Seahawks, one of the most improved defenses from start of the year to the end because I think at the beginning of the year we were like, Lions have a bad defense. Seahawks have a bad defense. They yeah. had that game that was, what, 48? Yeah. 45? Right, right. They, they couldn't stop anything. They were, I think they were one of those, like, for the third year in a row, like on a historical pace at, at some point early in the year to be, like, the worst defense in the yeah. history of football. Maybe most improved. Definitely this improved. It, to the point where I like their scheme, hmm. and I think they do some cool things and coverages and their game plan specific, which I like. What would I you like. call their scheme? It's 3-4 Vic Fangio-ish. It's, it's that school of, of, of coaching, right? Um, I'm blanking out on – I know they have the old Bears D coordinator, Sean Desai, up there, and they also have their other D coordinator who also has Chicago background. Mm. So that's what it is. So and what is it that you like about that? I, I just like that it's got, you know, the – it's got some um, some zone coverages where it's like uh, – what, what, I'm mess, messing with my word – you know, mixed zones, They're yes. playing this kind of zone here, that kind of zone there. You know, the game plan specific part of it where they'll double the guy and play zone over here or, you know, they're just, they'll, they'll do anything. Right. They play tendencies and formations and, you know, it's like, hey, this is cover three this week, like you always hear me say, but this team, this is cover three is a little different this week because they attack it a little different. They're, they're very good like that. They just don't have big time players up front. You know, that's the only thing they're, they're, if they can just get some difference makers on their front four, it'll change them around. Because I think the scheme and the back seven are quite dangerous. And that's where I look to be, like like I said, the Jets, they can win this game. They need some a semblance of a running game. If it becomes throw the ball more than 40 times, then I would say they're probably going to lose the game. Got it. Right? Other side of the ball, it's just can Seattle block? The Jets at all. So that's the question. Right. So Seattle's defense may be one of the most improved. Jets' defense has been rock solid almost all year long. I think almost that's an underreported part of the team. Really, it's been all Zach Wilson this, offense that. But it's like that defense has been elite basically all season long. Last week was their worst showing. You know, and it was it was what I brought up in the Picks podcast. One thing I was worried about was Jacksonville's size. Were they going to be so big that it was just going to negate the Jets' speed? To the point where they were just like, yeah, well, we're not gonna, we're just gonna go this way. We're just gonna double team you downhill and not give you gaps, and we're just gonna push you back and overpower you. And that's what they did. But the Seahawks team can't do that, and I, that's what I do worry about. There's a hundred, a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, Geno Smith. We've seen last week against the Chiefs, the week before that against the the 49ers, teams that can rush the passer. I mean, holy shit, he's under pressure every time he drops back. They can't block anybody. You know, and the run game isn't that special either. So there's like here's a I think a system and the way they call passing plays that I think they can make some plays down the field against this Jets defense, but I'm not so sure he's gonna have the time to make it. That's mm-hmm. that's gonna be the problem. And it's the Seattle scheme they're running. I would think Pete is gonna have some, hey, I know there are rules when we line up in this formation. Let's run these plays, right? So I would think there's going to be some opportunities for them, but I don't, I don't know if they can block them. I just, just the biggest thing in any way, and that's that's what's scary about it altogether. Geno could be running for his life in a revenge game for Geno Smith in yeah. a game where the playoffs are on the line. You might think that's the biggest storyline of this game. You know, it's like they they still have a playoff chance. No, this could determine the offensive rookie of the year. Our friends over at Bet MGM are helping us out with that. So right now. Garrett Wilson is the favorite. I didn't know that. That's, yeah. That surprises me. Uh, minus 200. So he is the odds-on favorite at this point. Has had a very good rookie year out of Ohio State. Uh, but then you got Kenneth Walker, the second choice right now. Plus 450. Missed a couple games. Came back last week. Yeah. Over 100 yards. Right. Um, you look at some of his numbers for Kenneth Walker. It's kind of interesting. It's that, that rush is over-expected that Next Gen does. He actually doesn't rate out very well on that. Like, oh, I think it's like 30% of his rushes are over the amount that you'd expect. But I guess where he makes up for it is that once he's gone, he he's is, gone. He's gone. Right, right. Uh, Brock Purdy is plus 700, the third choice. Uh, it, it's an interesting year. Who's your guy? Who's your guy? I can understand Garrett Wilson, you know, being in the lead. I, I think he's been maybe the most consistently good out of all these guys throughout the year. You know, unfortunately, 
injuries and like things like that have played into the the conversation. Like Kenneth Walker, I feel like if he didn't get hurt and have a few games like that, his stats will be at a point where we go, oh no, no, right. he's the rookie of the year. I know. You know, Brock Purdy, I just don't know if he's gonna have enough time on the field to. What if, what if he goes six that. and zero? Well, th- 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 I think it'll make people think yeah. he'll steal a few votes. Christian Watson, I felt like was on his way there for a while. You know, if he could have maybe just made one more play on Sunday or one more time, like I think he'd probably be up in the second or third yeah. spot with that. But I think if you made me bet right now, I'd, I, I'd probably go with Garrett Wilson. You know, one, it's a big game. They can't, they, the big final two games, they can't run the ball all that well. And they designed the majority of their pass plays for him. And I would think he's going to be the main focus once again this week. And And Seattle, who, you know, again, like I said, I like their – they're, they're not afraid to take a chance every now and then. They have to because their pass rush isn't that great. So then they have to blitz and, and do some things like that to where he could get some one-on-one opportunities against a Tariq Woolen, and, and we'll see what happens there. Most rush yards are among rookies. Kenneth Walker actually third. He has 803. That's behind Tyler Algier from the Falcons. Yeah. And first with 939, Damian Pierce mm, for Damian, Houston. Is he hurt right I, now? He's been he, hurt too, right? He's been, he's hurt been, too. been banged the up. Season. And this is where it's just like, you know, yeah, Algier. Unfortunately, he's just not involved in it because they're not good enough, I guess, yeah. or not enough on the. But he's a he's a workhorse. Kind of a down year for for the offensive rookies, like Definitely. staying healthy. Right? Definitely, none of them have really been able to stay healthy. Right. Yeah, Watson. It took a little while for him to yeah. get healthy and then get indoctrinated in the offense. Chris Olave. I've liked what I've seen from Chris he, Olave. Yes, it's just that their offense has gotten inconsistent at times. He had to deal with injury a few times himself. Yeah, and. Yeah, their quarterback play is, is just not always consistent in the passing game to help them out there. I know like, like five weeks ago I would have gone, oh, Lavi looks like he's going to win it five, six weeks ago. He was kind of a mainstay of that, that Saints attack. Yeah. But uh, they've kind of played a different way. He's not too far behind Garrett Wilson no. in total yards. Garrett no. Wilson has 996 right now, and Olave has 940. And how many catches has he got? I don't know. You don't know? Good question. All right, well, I'll tell you. Garrett, I'm going to say uh, Garrett 65. Garrett Wilson has 71, and Olave has 63. There we I go. I was off by two. Just a little. You're all right. It was close. But, yeah, it's it's been a real good year. Uh, the action never stops. At BetMGM, you can sign up now using the bonus code SIMS. Your first wager is risk-free up to $1,000, Chris. So say you bet $100 on your boy, yeah, Chris Olave, to win Offensive Rookie of the Year. If you win, you'll get $3,000. Cha-ching. But if you lose, you'll still get $100 worth of free bets. Cha-ching! Simply download the BetMGM app today or go to BetMGM.com. Enter the bonus code SIMS to make your first wager risk-free up to $1,000. It's cha-ching or cha-ching. How could that be bad? Either way is a cha-ching. Right. But cha-ching responsibly. Right. As we always say. Don't get crazy at the end of the year here. That's right. Uh, Looking for your next paycheck here. What the F will happen? Week 17 preview continues. We go over to the north, the 12-win Minnesota Vikings that Chris has not said one nice thing about all season long. Mm. Every, every week in the comments, Chris is like, well, can he at least say one nice thing about it? No, <laughs> not going to happen. We're going to keep it going all year long. They're 12-3. and three. They're at the Packers. So here's the scenarios. Minnesota can still clinch the number one seed if they win out and the Eagles have to lose out, which you know, hurts. I don't know. The latest on him, if he doesn't play, maybe. Possible. Uh, the Packers, they are eliminated with a loss plus a Detroit win or a loss, plus a Washington win or a loss, plus a Seattle and New Orleans loss. Okay, that's a lot going on for the Packers. The, the, the headline for the Packers is that they're still in it here because I think five weeks ago we were like, well, they're done. It's amazing. Aaron's retiring. It's over. He might not even play the last few weeks. Why would you? Put in uh, Jordan Love. It's over. Well, I guess it's not over. They still have a chance there at, uh, at seven and eight. So, all right, let's think. What did you look at? You looked at the... I didn't look at Minnesota. I, you I looked you know, at the Packers. I didn't watch the film of that. I watched the Giants Vikings game very closely on Saturday, and and gosh, I've watched Minnesota on film so much. I, I have a great feel for them, uh, but the uh, of course the Packers. I, I saw both of that against the Dolphins. All right, so let's start with the uh, the Packers offense yeah. because I think that's most interesting for us. Last time they played was back in Week One, long time ago. Twenty three seven Vikings got the win. Rodgers threw for under 200 yards, had an interception, no touchdown, was sacked four times. Um, so that, that Packers offense, mm-hmm. we'll start with on the transfer. Is it me? Am I missing something? Or would Rodgers help this situation by adding a pump fake? I feel like I don't see him ever do it. As a quarterback, how much risk is there 
in a pump fake. All right, so the offense has improved. We'll get into that, but let's start with on the transfers uh, idea of a pump fake for Aaron Rodgers. Well, he, he for so long was such a pump faker. I think that's what he's probably getting to on the transfer. I mean, that's what you know we loved about him for years was hey, nobody's open, but he's sitting there in the pocket and he'd manipulate people by a little shoulder or just a little flinch of the hand and the arm, right? He's got giant hands like Pete's saying in my ear. Yeah, so he could do that. And then, oh, man, he's looking over here. He's kind of pumping over there. And then he'd shift over to the other side of the field and throw a laser. And you'd go, oh, my gosh, the guy's wide open. Yeah, well, he looked over here for three seconds and pump fake six times to that side. So the whole defense moved over there. He doesn't hold the ball long enough to do any of that anymore. That's the big problem. You know, it's just, you know, as I said, midway point part of the year, and and you saw that again this week, he doesn't really throw the ball down the field unless it's bump man to man. And he just goes, wait, I can throw a fade outside the numbers and put it in a spot where my guy gets it or nobody gets it. You know, and that's to me where he's lost a little bit of that tactical aggressiveness within the normal rhythm of the offense. But having said that, right, I think that formula is going to hold true against Minnesota. Like, I actually think it's going to put Minnesota in some bind here. Christian Watson's health would be crucial to this game. They have nobody in Minnesota secondary that can run demand to man. Minnesota plays normal, bland zone coverages. The RPO game and all those are going to be wide open. Like they're going to force Minnesota into, I think, some defenses that they don't want to play. Minnesota does not stop the run all that well. You know, Green Bay is pretty good at running the ball. You know, traditional run, too. They don't rely on the quarterback to run. I bet you if you just took running back running things, Green Bay's would be even ranked higher in, in the running department. So I could see that posing some problems for them a little. And again, with the conservative zones and Minnesota plays, I could see Green Bay eating up clock, doing all of that, taking their time there. So this is, again, a, not a great Green Bay offense, but it's the worst defense in football, which is crazy to say about a 12-3 and three football team. But it's literally the worst. And it's no longer can we say, oh, well, at least they don't let you score touchdowns. No, everybody scores touchdowns too now. We've all, they've all been figured out. And that's where I go, they might have to come out of their comfort zone because of this dink and dunk RPO shit that Aaron Rodgers started. You're smirking over there. What are you Since you at? brought up the Minnesota Vikings defense and calling it the worst ever. So if you're a Vikings fan out there hoping that Chris would say something positive, no, it's actually gotten worse. <laughs> it's going in the other direction. Uh, two stats and a lie on this Vikings yeah, defense. Let's do it. So let's see. We give you a chance to come back here. I, I like this. The first I'm, time we've I'm, done two. I know. Thank God because you uh, messed up for the first time the first time. <laughs> All right. So this is a Vikings defense. One of these is not true. Two are true. They're top 10 in rushing yards given up. Oh, so a silver lining for that, this Vikings that, that's, team. That's, that's a lie. Hold There's on. no way. Hold There's on. no let me, way. Let me at least read the other okay. two. <laughs> they're bottom three in allowing scores per drive, and they're bottom three in giving up passing first downs. So you've already – are you sticking by? Is that your final answer? I, I just – if they're top 10 in rushing yards given up, then, I, then, I, then I've been smoking way too much shit lately, Okay. So they are 19th in total rushing yards given up. So there is no silver lining for this Minnesota (laughs) uh, Vikings. It is true. They are bottom three just ahead of the Falcons and Lions in uh, drives ending in scores 42% of the time. And they are bottom three. They're actually the worst in giving up passing first downs. They have given up 205 passing first downs. They are so bad at pass defense. Like I told you a few weeks ago, the New England Patriots – they, the, whose pass offense stinks, by the way, as we've already discussed. Mm-hmm. The Minnesota played past defense the whole game, and Minnesota and New England still said, we're not even good at throwing it, but we're still going to throw it on you guys. That's, that kind of says it all. It's the, they beg people to run the ball, and teams still throw the ball on them. So that's scary, let alone this is a team that, yeah, I think has got a lot of little ways to – attack their cover for land zone and do all that, let alone, I think, going to run the ball a little too to where, you know, now they're going to have to get out of that. And they might have to be on an island versus Dobbs or Christian Watson. And, again, that plays into Rodgers. You know, Rodgers, what we saw last week, he missed a few shots down the field, should have hit Christian Watson on the, the fourth down, right? You know, had another one, a go route that he missed too. But we saw him also hit two or three of them as well. That's where he feels comfortable. 
And that's where they can be scary. So we'll see. I don't know necessarily if their defense can stop Minnesota, well, but that's their offense the question, is going to give right? some issues. Could yeah. be a high-scoring game because, yeah. thank God, the Vikings have a very good offense. And Cheese Curd 19 says Joe Barry usually doesn't have the answers, but pretending he did. How can the Packers slow down Justin Jefferson? <sighs> I, I, you know, it, it's it's – I'd like to see them, you know, do some – wait, we're going to double Justin Jefferson here on a third down. You're going to have to beat us with somebody else. They're not a huge team that does that. Or Jair Alexander, man-to-man, and, hey, you're man-to-man, I'm everywhere. We'll, we'll ha- if he runs the deep cross or something, we'll have somebody to protect you there so you don't have to, like, cover every square inch of the field against one of the greatest athletes on the planet. Uh, th- that, that's where I would look at it more than anything. But – You know, again, Green Bay, yeah, their defense, I I just, I know people want to jump on Joe Barry a little bit, and especially because it was good last year, and I think it exceeded expectations last year. I I do think their talent's overrated. I'm I'm sorry. I I think people across the board, the whole group is overrated, in my opinion. I mean, like, anybody you name, I'll just go, "Eh, they're overrated, in my opinion. I mean, it really is. That's how I feel about it. I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, Clark, I know Kevin, I mean, uh, Clark, Kenny Clark, Kenny Clark is the only guy I, and to me, he's not as good as people talk about him. And, and I, uh, yep. I you know. And Pete's in my ear going, PFF loves him. And you know, that's Devondre Campbell was, I think PFF's number two linebacker. That's where last PFF year. has way too much power because we got too many people who are just looking at a PFF grade and going, well, they must be right. And I've already come up with 10 instances this year where PFF was f-ing wrong and it's skeptical. So they have too much power in this say, in this in this say with all this. We're vote for all pro players who get big contracts and change their life, and other guys get cheated because of a PFF grade. Um, I don't like that, obviously, but I, it's going to be a tough task for Green Bay. It is. I would imagine they're favored, though. I I don't know why I think that. Are they favored, Pete? In well, this they're game? at home. At Minnesota's. Home, they are favored. Are they? What are they favored by? <laughs> Three point. I mean, the Vikings, the first ever 12 win team in the history of the NFL, who's been favored in what, like maybe five of their games, it's, six of their games. I, I, you know, <laughs> I get it, you know, and it's in, in Green Bay. It's a must win for Green Bay, Minnesota. Yeah, I know there's the outside chance that they could still get the, the number one seed, but I think that's highly unlikely. And I think they know that. So I, I understand that. But, mm. yeah, with Green Bay, uh, you know, like to me what's scary about this is Green Bay's run defense sucks. And, like, Minnesota's not even a good running team, but if they get the running game going on you, forget about it. You'll have no chance of stopping Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson because they will have a good play-action pass attack off of that. So that's where I – you know, I could see this maybe being a little bit more of an offensive showing yeah. than you would think in a cold weather, late yeah. December Green Bay game. I hope game. it's like cold, but it's still like not sloppy. I out could there, see it I think being it's like, yeah, 28 24, 30 to 27. I don't think that would be shocking in this football. Right, game. We got to make the Vikings fans feel better, and we will do that this week with our Big Butt Awards. Woo! It is we that time. Like big butts and we cannot lie. The big butt of the week. Oh. Time to give some love to these Woo! big guys. Some it's, touches. It's a couple sacks, a horse <laughs> fumble. He's a butting superstar. Woo! And give it to him, Ahmed. One butt cheek. And this is why you're the big butt expert of the world right now. <laughs> I like when you go so happy. You're like, some tushes. Yep, some, some tushes, tushes, baby. That's right. Let's give an award to a tush on the Minnesota Vikings. Whoa. We've beaten them down enough. Look at you kissing their butt just because you defense. knew I would. And you wore a purple sweat, sweatshirt today. Kissing their big butt. Uh, my edge big butt of the week goes to Daniil Hunter. He was tied with Max Crosby this week. Nine pressures, most, most by an edge player this week. Had two sacks, had another quarterback hit. Kind of had a slow start to the year. And he kept talking to the local media there. They're like, ah, oh, this, you know, don't have many sacks. Usually you're a big sack guy. He goes, trust me, bro, sacks will come. That was his big quote. He's and popped a lot lately, They have right? come here at the yeah, end of the year. So right. if, you're, if you're a Vikings fan, yeah, yes, your defense might be the worst. But who knows? Maybe it will just get a little bit better if Daniil Hunter starts playing like Daniil Hunter should play. Well, yeah, I think with the, him, the health of Darius Smith, if they are, you know, 100% good to go playoff time, yeah, they'll be a pain in the butt for sure. Uh, it, it's, I, uh, you know, again, like I said, I was watching that game closely. 
Daniel Jones, I knew he was under pressure. I guess I didn't realize it was Daniel Hunter so much. I yeah. guess that's what I didn't give it credit for. You know, but the you know, it's not shocking to hear. The Giants, again, their offensive line better. It's still nothing special. And you could still they're still playing a game of protecting their offensive line in the past game. They don't hold the ball a whole lot. They have to move the quarterback and do boots and play actions to help them out. Um, but, man, good showing by him right there. That's that's pretty unbelievable, nine pressures. For the second week in a row, I almost gave it to Nick Bosa. Yeah. I feel like I've said that about Nick right. Bosa basically all season long, yeah. which I'll take that into consideration when we have Big Butt of the Year yeah, award. You should. Over on the defensive tackle side, uh, we are no giving brainer. it to Chris Jones. For the second time this year, he joins Dexter Lawrence. Sexy Dexy. The only two-time winners of this award. He led all defensive tackles. He had nine pressures as well. Also had a sack, three quarterback hits. And so Chris Jones, you watch that tape. <laughs> Was it like, man, was it like this guy's going to win the big butt? It's like every play. I mean, it's just he was everywhere. I, you know, that was one where, yeah, I did watch the tape and I would have got it felt like it was more than nine pressures. Yeah. And it felt like it was him all the time, you know, let alone batted passes. And he's just he's a force or the amount of times he broke through the line of scrimmage and a run play, and then Kenneth Walker has to redirect and go somewhere else. And he gets three-yard gain, and somebody else gets a tackle, but you're like, oh, man, Chris Jones did it all right there. He's the guy. Uh, uh, I didn't get the hit on this when we talked about the Seattle a little bit. Yeah. Kansas City's defense last two, three weeks, ever since the Cincinnati game, there's been a hair more of like, okay, we're going to trust the rookies to do a few more things schematically. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's changed them. They're not, you know how I, earlier I was a little just like, it's either all out blitz, man to man, or it's fake the all out blitz and they end up in Tampa too, right? I'm seeing like more in the repertoire here the last few weeks. I think it's going to come in handy. I think he trusts his rookies and the younger guys. And damn, I don't know, just watching that game, uh, they just, I feel like their, their rookies have gotten comfortable That's to the point of the year where they can let it fly now. Yeah, Carlaftis is popping. Williams is popping. McDuffie. McDuffie is popping. Exactly right. The two linebackers they have, they're flying all over the field. One of the things I wrote in my notes about that game, and I know I didn't send you those notes because I, I just finished up this morning, was just that, like, that Kansas City defense with Chris Jones up front and everybody, they got a little of everything as far as their versatility up front. But I'd be hard pressed to find a back seven that's much faster than the pay, uh, the Chiefs. It, it's it's one four three and low four four guy. All, all their two linebackers are both four four, right? I think. I mean, one of them was like literally four four flat. Willie Gay, you know, they're two corners. You know, Legarius Sneed and Williams, who are the outside corners when they're a nickel, they're both four three guys. And you know, a McDuffie's low four four. Juan Hor Thornhill, their safety was four three. Hmm. Justin Reed is four four. So just to tell you there, that that's where they can you know, maybe become a better unit than we thought they could in the playoffs now that they're kind of expanding the playbook a little bit. And when you produce multiple Big Butt of the Award, uh, of the Week Award winners, I mean, you're doing something right. That's so right. We have the elephant uh, graphic. There it is. Chris Jones, congratulations once again. We salute you. Daniil Hunter for the first time. Way to come on strong at the end of the year. So you were talking about all that, and I know – on Monday, I said uh, Kyle Shanahan's my coach of the year. Yeah, I think uh, Kevin O'Connell's getting a lot of love out there. How the way they've won these close games, turned the culture around. It seems like there. I think he'd be a great pick for coach of the year as well. Andy Reid doesn't get the love that he probably deserves no. because Patrick Mahomes is there. But think of what has changed with them. Tyreek Hill gone. Resha reshape the offense with some new pieces. Haven't missed a beat. In fact, have gotten better. And then you have a defense filled with rookies. Exactly that now is getting better at the end of the year. Yeah. I think he won't win it, but he should be getting more he, consideration. He's one of those guys that's like LeBron or Michael Jordan or Bill Belichick. It's assumed. It's, it's, it's just like a little Take assumed. him for granted, right? right? Yeah, exactly right. There's, there's, it's, he's definitely reached that category or stratosphere, which yep. you know in itself is almost its own award. Like, you've been so good for so long. We expect it, and you're not in this conversation anymore. Like, this is for – newbies over here exactly you know yes. guys that haven't been good and have exceeded our expectation or no but somebody we never heard of and we didn't think he could do this job yeah yeah that's who it's for you uh, can win it you just have to go undefeated i mean pretty much it seems like that you got to do something <laughs> like monumental yeah. in the lures of the nfl yeah without patrick mahomes right. uh, mike tomlin has never won the coach of the year and i think that's a travesty i i love mike tomlin he's my guy. He's never had a losing season 
and might not this year, <laughs> crazily enough. Uh, as our previews continue, it is Steelers at Ravens. You know, I think in my mind, it's the game of the week in the NFL, and you'll get to watch it on Sunday Night Football and NBC. You know, that's just not because they pay my, you know, mortgage yeah. and all that stuff. You just like that AFC North match. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, I was shocked. I thought I was going to be da- uh, Patriots, Dolphins for sure. So there are things on the line for right. both of these teams. The Steelers can be eliminated from the playoffs with a loss or a Miami win. Uh, Baltimore, they can still win the division. A lot of machinations, how that can happen. Then they play uh, at Cincinnati the final week, and so that would be that would be a good one. I mean, we don't think we'll have Lamar Jackson in this game. Doesn't seem like correct. it. Correct. Um, Kenny Pickett, he went out with a concussion when they played before, but right. he's there. He's back. He's back. So he'll play. Yep. Um, all right, just real quick. I don't think you looked at film of either of these teams, but this is a game with playoff implications yeah. and seeding implications. Right. Kind of what jumps out to you most about this well, game? Well, I, I think the Pickett injury was huge in the first game. Mm. Uh, you know, Pickett, you know, Trubisky Second made, drive of the game, yeah. Yeah, Trubisky made some crucial mistakes, you know, with some aggressive throws in the red zone, fringe red zone. Pickett's been really good for a rookie quarterback protecting the ball. You know, his mobility to run and get a few cheap first downs and his accuracy within the short to intermediate pass game is an advantage for them. You know, so they're good in that department. Where I was shocked the first time around was just that Baltimore ran the ball the way they did on Pittsburgh. 215 yards on 43 carries. J.K. Dobbins went uh, for 120. And, and that's, that's, that's what scares me a little. But, gosh, I still look at it in, the, in a lot of ways. I, I, I guess there's a part of me to think I, I just have a hard time thinking Pittsburgh's going to get gashed in the run game like that again. I and, mean, again, I expect this to be close, field goal type of football game. And, you know, again, if, if, Baltimore, if Baltimore has that type of day, 200 yards rushing, all that, they're going to win the game. But if it's like, you know, 140 or below, I'd go, probably go I, I'd like Pittsburgh to do that. You know, that means that Baltimore hasn't controlled the clock quite the same, and they haven't ripped off you know maybe a few as many big plays in the run game that way. Uh, I do think with Pittsburgh's you know good enough running game, and the fact that Baltimore doesn't want to play man a whole lot, you know that can play into their favor of being able to pick apart the zone a little bit, get the ball out of his hands quickly, and do all that. Uh, I, I don't know who I'm going to pick in this one. This is a very even game. And it's one of those where I feel like, yeah, run game and just whoever makes that one crucial turnover is going to affect this one. You've lost a couple lately on Football Night America. I know. I know. I you mean, won the last one, right? You well, I picked the Bucks. So I mean, you, you got that which one. I, you, which you was nervous. Right. It. Right. Was you it know? a clean sweep? Did everyone pick the Bucks? Everybody picked the Bucks, right? We've had that a few times. I know. You know, the week before, I chickened out with my Giants. I took Washington. So, yep, I, I ate Never that one. Never that one down. Right. And then the week before that is the one I'm really mad at. Because that was the one where, did I do the Peacock show with you that week? Where I went, the Chargers match up. They can upset the Dolphins. But I still went with the Dolphins and didn't have the no, guts to do we it. we didn't do it together. Okay, but, but, yeah. Yeah. All right. You can get back on track depending yeah. on who you win or a pick to win the uh, the game. And if they do that, one more game to talk about. Yeah. To preview. We can dive into this one deep. Bills at Bengals. Uh, 12 win Bills team. 11 win Bengals team could both win their uh, their division. Bills have clinched the yep. East. And so they are going to be the division champion. They're going to host the playoffs. They could host all the way through. They could be the one seed here, although that's still to be determined. Bengals trying to clinch the top seed. Um, Bengals can clinch. Uh, I'm sorry. The Bengals can clinch the division. With a win and a Baltimore loss, can still clinch the number one seed, so they can still do that if they win out. Yeah. And Kansas City loses one game. Right. Buffalo clinches the one seed with a win and a Kansas City loss. And so you looked at the the Bills, and we talked a little bit about the Bengals and how good Joe Burrow was. We'll we'll get back to that, but let's let's kind of start real quick with the the Bills because I think there's a idea out there is that. Not everything is clicking, and it's it seems hard, and it seems all on the right shoulder of Josh Allen, which you have said in the past. Yeah. And Dolphins game was kind of like that. Um, of course, it was against the Chicago Bears, the last game they played, and yeah. it was closer probably for most of the game, right. or more of the game than we thought it would be. Yep. So anything new that we're learning about this this Bills offense? Because they were able to run the ball. But you wonder if that was just because it was the Chicago Bears. So what did you see when you looked at the film a little closer on the Bills' offense? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a game where 
uh, the, you, you never really sensed Chicago was stopping Buffalo. It was a little bit like we talked about with some of the other games. Buffalo doing some dumb shit. I mean, you know, throwing a curl route to Gabe Davis, first down, and he fumbles the ball as he's getting tackled. You know, Josh Allen, both of his interceptions. You know, one, they're in the red zone fringe, and he yeah, makes a bad decision, throws it into double coverage in the end zone. You know, the other one, he's throwing a check down to the back, and it was off target. It looked like the wind blew it like five feet to the right, yeah. and which we saw. Like, I, did you see the punt in the game? No. They had a punt in the game that, like, hit the 20-yard line, rolled to about the 15, and was going to stop, uh-huh. and the wind blew it to, like, the two-yard line. <laughs> I didn't like, see total, that. Like, it was stopped, and the wind blew it to the two. So it was really windy. Uh, but either way, there were some mistakes there that, that I'm just trying to say that they made. Um, <clears throat> Chicago's defense is not good. There's no, and I repeat, there is no f***ing way the Bills are going to run the ball in the Cincinnati Bengals. There's no way. Is DJ Reader dead? No, he's not, so he's playing. There's no way, all right? There's no way. So I, I just, again, that's a nice story. They did some things the right way in that football game. They're not going to have those same opportunities. This is, this is an interesting one. I mean, I, we know it's a good game, and it's close. So it's going to be close, and it's two awesome quarterbacks. It's one where I look at Ahmed and go, the defenses, I think, have the advantage in both sides. Hmm. I, I yeah I know it threw you for a loop there right yeah well one I don't think I don't think that Cincinnati I don't think Buffalo is gonna be able to run on Cincinnati two I think that Cincinnati will one be able to play man to man on Buffalo two we already know they have a lot of good zone coverages they're good in both ways there right so that's I could see them really posing some problems I guess the only thing I'm scared about a little is just that Hubbard, Hendrickson, banged up, not sure. What, can they contain Allen and stop him from scrambling and buying too much extra time, right? You know, I think they're going to have a plan for him when it comes to quarterback spy and all of that. They're, they're, they're not going to let him run, run. But buying time is also part of the element here, that you can't let him just run around back there and, and make your guys cover for 20 seconds. Nobody can cover that long. So that's the one area I look at to can they contain him that way? And within that, okay, if it does become crazy, like I think Cincinnati would probably elect to blitz a little bit to contain him, and then that's where you could be taking chances. But I, that would be the only way. I think the, the Bengals' defense is going to pose some real problems for them. I really do. And I don't, again, as you've heard me say all year, there's only one guy that can really separate in Buffalo from man-to-man coverage, and that's Stephon Diggs. Everybody else, they're going to go, well, we feel good about that matchup. We're good with that. And it's, it's not a, a team that does a lot of cross use and crosses you and picks you that way to where I think they'll feel comfortable about playing man-to-man in some certain situations. It's just you can't play man-to-man in his face, blitz, with no safety help. You right. do that too many times, he's going to burn you. Um, but, yeah, I think the Bengals can really, really give their offense some issues. I mean, you've been complimenting the Bengals for a while now, saying yeah. they're one of the better defenses in, yeah. the, in the NFL. And you name-checked a few guys in your notes, the linebackers, Logan Wilson, Jermaine Pratt. Yeah. You think are special and not they're getting enough pub. Definitely. I mean, they're everywhere, every week. You know, Jesse Bates. He's phenomenal. Von Bell. Von Bell's phenomenal. The two corners are really good. You know, the rookie uh, Taylor Britt, he can fly. I mean, he's, he's not perfect. He's a rookie, but he's got big talent. So, yeah, there's nothing to look at them. And, and, and scheme, talent-wise, there's not a weakness on the Bengals' defense. And then they're playing a team that, yeah, is not a good running football team. I'm not ready to go there yet just because they ran successfully against the Chicago Bears, who, like Ahmed, were it, – it's funny. Like, they just didn't believe Buffalo would run it. They have running plays where they're literally – he's handing it off, and the linebackers are running down the field in coverage because they've been told to slow play the run, right? So even on running plays, they're taking two steps back in the passing game. You know, Cincinnati's not going to have to worry about that. They're not going to do it that way. Let alone they might be able to do it that way because they're going to just go, hey, DJ Reader, Hill, rest of you big – you got it. Now we can worry about all the Josh Allen throws down the field. I just have a hard time thinking Buffalo is going to consider. I can think this game could be 
sneaky low scoring. Is that crazy to say? I think it, I feel like it's crazy to say. You're leaning towards the under. Maybe that'll be one of your Maybe best it bets. Is. I don't even know what the over under is, but I could see the Bills also giving the Bengals offense issues as well. I would guess 48. 49 and a half. 49 and a half. Right. I'm not even a gambler really. I'm right. just kind of like nailing those almost so, basically. 49 and, who's and, a half. and who's favored? The 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 Bengals the favored by 2. Bills Ooh, by one Bills and a half. Bills by one and a half. So they're expecting like a 25, 24 game, 26, 24, whatever, you know. You're taking the under? Until, you know, 27, 23, whatever you want to say there. I, I, I feel like I would take the under. It's always scary with guys like this because it's like you shut them out the whole game and then, you know, they both scored 14 points in the last three minutes of the game and made some unbelievable throws. But, yeah, I, I would feel the under in this one. So I think one more thing to touch on in this game is the Bills' defense. Yeah. Because if you think it's going to be low scoring, they're yeah. going to contain Joe Burrow, figure right. out a way to do it. They definitely contain Justin Fields now. Yeah. Obviously, a completely different quarterback and a way of playing. But no one had really done this in the past. Eight straight games Justin Fields had with 60 or more rushing yards, had just 11 in this one, seven carries. What did they do so well to contain him? They, you know, it's something I talked about. They, they, I knew they would have a plan for Justin Fields. They're, they're just too well coached in Buffalo to not. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, again, like I picked Buffalo to win by like 13 or 14 points and cover the spread. But it, Justin Fields scared me from making a best bet because you're just like, hey, we've seen a few teams think they got a plan. And he's, he's running up the sidelines for 60 yard touchdowns. Um, fast linebackers. Pass rush doing the right things. Pass rush not going past the quarterback. You know, what's the point of rushing upfield and getting behind Justin Fields and leaving gaps between the defensive tackle and the defense end where he can just run full speed? And now, even if you do got a quarterback spy, it's like, yeah, good luck. You're one on one against one of the best athletes in football. They kind of just mushed the pocket. The defensive ends never really got on the edge to get pushed by. They kind of just went, hey, we're going to stay right here so we can see you, and if you do break, we can break with you on the outside, and you can't turn the corner. You'll just have to keep kind of floating backwards and throw the ball out of bounds. That, some spying of him in certain situations, and then they have two athletic linebackers who, you know, if he did make a straight line, beeline for something, they could run with him and at least give him some issues there. But I think those were the big things. I don't know. Did you see anything else in my notes that I, that I left out? Uh, as far as that plan of attack, but you know, I think those were the things that jumped out to me. I think it was good. It should be a good game. That's we got some good games, definitely. And with them on defense, right? Again, Cincinnati can't run the ball all that well, so I don't expect that to be a huge issue. Right. And you've heard me say, like, you can't. Buffalo doesn't really want to play man coverage. They just want to dabble in it every now and then. They want to play their zones because Frazier and McDermott are awesome. You know, they're the ultimate, right, from you and I have been working. Yeah. We're going, I don't know what that f***ing coverage is, but they got everybody dropping in the place they're trying to throw the ball. They're one of the few teams I look at to go, they might be able to play zones. And because of the simplicity of the Bengals' offense, figure out the right spots to drop guys. And, hey, this guy blitzes, but this guy drops out over here. So that's where I could see them giving problems to Joe Burrow, too. Even though he's amazing in zones, they have the right mix of creative zone, good enough pass rush to where you know, he might not be able to just go, oh, wait, there's a hole in the zone. Let me get it out quick. And then it might have to, oh, wait, that, that part of the zone's not. What is this coverage? Oh, no, the, the pocket's collapsing, right? I could see that being an issue. I don't think they're going to give them a lot of man-to-man shots. If they do, they're going to lose because whoever is on Tredavious White is going to be open. And that, that's the other thing, too. Like, if the Bills play man-to-man right now, and I'm the quarterback of the other team, I'm going, where's 27? And he can't run with our good receivers. Uh, and, yeah, I, th- that would be an issue. Man. But I don't think that's going to be something that they dial up quite often. Tredavious White got to the end of the preview. And well, he's, he's just not like 100% yet. Right at the end I of know. The well, he's like almost got out scot-free. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, One more thing. Yeah, it just, uh, he just, he just, he's not hitting on all cylinders there. So that, uh, that's a problem. Tough to say who's going to win this game, although the homies were definitely sure that the Bills were going to win the division. Oh, yeah. As we do a check on the homies playoff picks, we had 816 entries. like to update these from time to time. Uh, we have three homies whose entries could still correctly predict all eight division winners Wow! right now. So three homies. Shout out to Arv Kara, Derek Jasper, and Katie Anderson. 
Way out to there. Go, well guys. done. Way to go, the three homies right there. Now, most of us had the Bills winning the AFC East. 97% of us, we yep. were all right, Chris, right. you and me included. 2% had them as a wild card team. Uh, eight people had them out of the playoffs entirely. Quest Diagnostics is on their way to your house. Uh, 84% had the Bengals making the playoffs. You have won your ticket including us two. 85% had the Ravens making the playoffs. Yeah. We've won that one as we well. Did. I'm surprised yeah. it was that high. I guess yeah. there weren't as many questions coming into the year. Lamar and – Yeah, I think people saw proper adjustments with the roster. They were division like favorites. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the, I, I picked them to win the division and have the Bengals be the wild card team. And as it sits right now, it looks like it's going to be the opposite. Uh, the Chargers are in now as a wild card, so you can cash that ticket. 63% had uh, them winning the wild card, including you, Chris. Yep. Well done. I had them winning the West. Yes. I went right. out on a limb yes, right there. Yes, you did. I didn't know Andy Reid would still be so good <laughs> and make all those new pieces work, uh, although they are in the in the playoffs. And I do have the Chargers winning the, the whole uh, thing. We so. know. We know. Uh, Falcons, five people had them in the playoffs. I'm sorry. That's not going to happen. Browns are not in the playoffs. 22 of you had them in the playoffs. And the Colts, that was the real shocker. They have been eliminated. 74% had them in the playoffs, so most of you. But that did not include Chris. You had the Colts missing the playoffs. One of your best picks Thank you. so far Thank you. this year. This is going to be one of my better things all year. It's just my playoff predictions before the season started. And I, I guess I'm, I need to get on the bet MGM future bets. That's where I've dropped the ball. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be sitting pretty That's if I true. would have thrown down and listened to myself on the Jacksonville Jaguars and a few of these other ones. I had them winning the division, the Colts. I was not alone. 66% mm, of you had I get them it. winning it all. Three people had the Colts winning the Super Bowl. Wow. That's unfortunate. Damn, that stinks. That's I'm not going to work out. We have to lay them to rest now Uh oh. with the Falcons and the Browns. So we end with our Requiems for a team. Could not do this on Monday because Kristen wasn't there with us, didn't have the music. It doesn't work without the music. No, we can't even. That's just part of the segment. We can't do this without the music. All right, let me find them here. So let's start with the Colts here, right? Let's start with them. Here lie the Indianapolis Colts. Their operation has become a cliche. Who's the next old quarterback who will lead the way? Plus, Jim Irsay's old friend, whose name is a weekend, welcome back to TV on Black Monday. <laughs> that was good. And he's very good on TV. Uh, he is. Jeff Saturday a, is very good strong, on TV. That strong, ending to he's, that one. He's very wow, good. Way to go there. <laughs> uh, maybe we should have ended with that one. All right, we got the Atlanta Falcons now. Matt Ryan's old team here. Right. All right, here lie the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, goodbye, Falcons. Those saying quarterback was an issue weren't lying. <laughs> Failures from the wook, uh, rookie and the Hawaiian. But never fear, the answer is clear. Resurrect the old bones of Matt Ryan. Bring them back. It was better with Matt Ryan. Uh, that, that's a good one, too. <laughs> a rookie and a Wookiee. Could, I threw a Wookiee could, in the there. Wookie, the Wookiee. The <laughs> Wookiee. I like the Wookiee talk there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they'd been much better with Matt Ryan. Uh, yeah, it's look. hard to say. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe worse. Maybe Who knows? worse. I know, right. Uh, and finally, the Cleveland Browns, 6-9. and nine. Here lie the Cleveland Browns. The year went immediately off track with an off-season move getting flack. Browns fans have another beer because even a Russian named Vladimir would have been a more likable quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Well, I'm Whoa. just saying, it's been a tough That's year for the Cleveland. That's controversial and it's shocking. It's, uh, that, man, look at this shock jock over here making comments not, like that. Not one of the more likable ones at I've this point. I've never heard Ahmed go that controversial I, right I there. I kept it clean. I kept it clean. He kept it clean. Yeah, it's He's not that likable. I'm not know, saying anything if, that's if not. If Vladimir Putin was your quarterback, it'd be less controversial. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, maybe, It's actually. been a dicey year. Know. Let's just say it's been a dicey <laughs> year for dicey. the Cleveland Browns. Very, very dicey. Uh, maybe it'll get better next year for all these teams. Of those teams, Colts, Falcons, Browns, who would you have the most faith in next year? Gosh. Probably they all Browns. have potential, but yeah, I've... I guess the Browns. Because they, they have a plan in place, right? They, they got they the got quarterback a great there. Line. They got a great running back. They have one receiver that we know is is pretty damn good. The quarterback's going to be better. You know, the defense, so they got to they gotta adjust and get some bigger people on defense. You've heard me say that a few times this year. You know, they they got to get better, bigger at linebacker. I would move Owusu Koromoa to safety if, and make him Cam Chancellor to add to that. That's what I would do. Um, but yeah, the Browns are the team that, you know, I, I guess I would look at there, but I do look at the other two Falcons and Colts and, and I do see potential. 
Like, I don't look at either one of those teams and go, oh, wow, they're really far off. I, I don't. I, and the Falcons obviously need the quarterback. Um, but their offense, I think, can be a pain in the butt, and yeah. they just got to get some more studs on the defensive side of the ball. And Colts have some places. It's just quarterback's going to be the issue for them too. All right, we have laid teams to rest. We have done a little different. What the F happened? It's a what little preview, which happen, is probably the, the way it's going to be from here on out. I would right? say kind so. Kind of a look right. ahead because we'll right. have some games week 18. Yeah. So I'm yeah. sure we'll have some crucial matchups that we'll have to go yeah. into and deep dive just what actually happened in the game. But you're right. It's, it's going to be look ahead to the, the look ahead type of year. Use the past to look right. into the future. And, I mean, thank God some of these teams are finally going to die and you're going to put them yeah. to rest. I mean, I'm just sick of all of them. What was Matt Casey saying? Like you, 10 teams you, could die next you week? You better get writing, get writing there, writing. Mark Twain. Okay? <laughs> you better get, get on writing. it. You're going to have a lot of writing. Was that do. my most controversial one? Vladimir Putin? Definitely. Yeah. 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 Who knew? Yeah. I've yeah. never heard he you go. That was, it's almost like a swear word for you. <laughs> you compared Deshaun Watson to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's true. He, no, he did start a war. We don't, it's not like I'm condoning anything that Vladimir Putin's done. I oh, want to make well, that thank clear. You. Thank you for clarifying that because you know, I, I was confused. I wasn't sure, but now at least we can have that out there so we don't get sued by Russia. I think right. I know where you're going with your picks, but we'll know for sure tomorrow. I think you do too. The Bengals, Bills, I don't know where I'm going with that one. The under, just take the under. You're right. I feel good about the under. under. I think you felt that I was leaning Dolphins over the Patriots. Um, Jet Seahawks is a really tough one for me. Who was our other one? Um, Steelers, Ravens, another tough one that I, I got to do more thinking. Panthers, here. Bucks. You're Panthers, leaning Panthers right now. I am right leaning now. Panthers right now. I am. Don't tell Florio, okay? Because he'll pick steal it tomorrow. He'll steal it. Yeah, and, then. and he'll go. Protect his lead. Yeah, he doesn't listen to this pod, so don't worry. <laughs> he doesn't even know it exists. He's selfish. He's yeah. a selfish guy. All right, everybody, enjoy the week. Thursday night football, Cowboys, Titans. I don't really know what to expect from that, but enjoy it because I don't know if the Titans are going to play anybody. I don't think the game matters to them. I know. You know, it's all about week 18 and them beating Jacksonville now. There's no other avenue for them to get in. You know, it's unlike Jacksonville. Jacksonville can still make it in as a seven seed if they don't yeah. win the division. So we might see a Titans team who just chalks it up tomorrow night. Might not be that exciting. But, again, the rest of the weekend is going to be awesome. So have fun watching the games. Happy New Year to everybody out there. Have a great time. Enjoy that. Enjoy the college football playoff, right? Ahmed, good luck to your oh. Michigan Wolverines. All right? Good luck to your Detroit Lions. Thanks for driving the ship as always. Clap it Clap up. Clap it up. Thanks for watching, homies. Hit subscribe to see all my unbuttoned videos. You get to see me, Ahmed Farid, all the big player breakdowns, game breakdowns, player interviews, and my film analysis. So please subscribe. Chris Sims Unbuttoned. Peace out.